even after the Chargers' latest tough loss. If the season ended today, the Chargers would still be in the playoffs. And I think we need to look at the playoff picture with a lot of people panicking a little bit about the Chargers. But obviously, this is a flawed team. This team has problems, David, that have to be discussed offensively and defensively. And I think there's also, you know, some questions for Tom Telesco if he's putting the right roster together for these coaches to, you know, put up better performances than they have. But a lot to get into today. Let's go ahead and get into it. You are Locked On Chargers, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Chargers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up and welcome into the Locked On Chargers podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Wade. Joined as always my co-host, David Drogenmeyer, and we've been covering the Chargers for over five seasons. We started doing our own Facebook Live show, Charger Domination Live, and now this is our fourth season as the host of the Locked On Chargers podcast, bringing you your team every day. What's up, guys? Thank you for making us your first listen. We very much appreciate it, especially after tough losses. I mean, those are the viewers. I mean, we definitely appreciate it just a little bit more on these weeks when the Chargers are coming off of a tough loss. But the great news for the Chargers is, is that they're still right in the middle of the playoff race. As much as it doesn't feel like it, it's a very congested AFC. An AFC that teams are going to beat each other up. So the Chargers, as bad as they've looked in certain games, are still right there. Can still really control their own destiny even. But thank you guys for joining in today. As always, make sure to go check out our new Locked on Chargers YouTube channel and subscribe there. Or follow us wherever you get your podcast from. We would really appreciate it. But... A lot to get into here, David, and a lot to unpack because as we see it right now, as the AFC playoff picture is still taking shape, even after this loss, you know, the Chargers dropped to six and five. They're still the seventh seed in the playoffs right now. So a lot of teams right on their heels. Part of that is their divisional record, which is, you know, really good still at two and one. That's a very good percentage, right? And that's helping them with a lot of tiebreakers. But Obviously, you don't want to leave it up to tiebreakers with this sort of thing, right? You want to just clearly have a better record than the other teams, more wins than they have at the end of the season, obviously. But I would say that at the same time, that's been one of the biggest problems is just not being able to create that separation in the division. But I do think it is important to kind of remember what the Chargers want is still right in front of them. Absolutely. I mean, the Chargers still have a lot of opportunities to gain ground with the games to follow. They still have several AFC West games. They have another game against the Broncos, another game against the Raiders, another game against the Chiefs. So those games, obviously, they count as two. They're very impactful. They're very important to try to take care of business, especially after dropping one with the Broncos. They they need to get that win back. But they, they have an important game this week as well, going up against the Bengals, another uh, team that's right next to them in, in this AFC playoff picture. So uh, if they're able to take this win, that could have implications uh, that really, uh, really will show themselves towards the end of the season. It'll definitely impact, you know, the AFC playoff race. And that's the thing is like, there's still so much posturing yet to happen. And at the same time, you know, being a seven seed is nice. You still have to go up right now against the Patriots if it were to end today because they are the you know two seed right now as things stack up. So like your matchup will be important as well. So like if you can get level with the Bengals right and you're both seven and five after this upcoming game, that is a huge swing for you right. And they're gonna you know have to play the Ravens and I mean or they might have played the Ravens twice already. Either way, like there are teams that are gonna have to beat each other up too because. There are some teams right behind the Chargers. The Broncos are right behind at 6-5, and five, so are the Raiders. You have chances against both of those teams, right, to get that game back or to take that game away, and that's a two-point swing, really, when you're looking at it. And there's games this weekend, like the Chargers versus the Bengals, obviously the biggest one for us, but, like, the Chiefs have to play the Broncos. So the Broncos could get knocked down a peg. The Chiefs could come back to the Chargers a little bit because the Chargers are only one game behind, right? So they can get back and leapfrog back into the division lead. This week, I mean, both those teams could be seven and five after this week and the Chargers divisional record would be better if the Broncos were to beat the Chiefs. So that'll have to play out. The Bills play the Patriots. That's another loss, you know, for one of those teams. And, you know, you still have teams like the Ravens and Steelers. So teams could fall out of it here as these divisional games fall out. But like the next two game stretch is really important because if you're looking at it, you have Cincinnati. If you win that, you go to seven and five. That feels good with a game coming up against the Giants. 
if you can go to eight and five, that's great. I mean, now you really have put yourself in the driver's seat with some tough games, right? A Thursday night football matchup after that against the Kansas City Chiefs. Hard to say how that one's going to swing right now with the way the Chargers secondary is playing and how much better the Chiefs are playing right now. But if you lose one of those games, right, and you lose two of the next three, you lose to the Bengals and the Chiefs. Now it's getting a lot tougher, right? Because then now you're sitting at seven and seven. Not really able to distinguish yourself as a clear playoff team. So these next two games, David, especially, you know, AFC game this weekend against the Bengals and then the game after that against a very beatable Giants team. Like, I just think those are two huge games where the Chargers can really take a hold of their season again, even after that tough loss. Well, and this Bengals game looks a whole lot more intimidating than it did before this season started. I mean, they they look a whole lot better, and uh, there's a lot of parity this year in the NFL. We've seen a a lot of crazy games. A lot of teams beat other teams that we thought had no business beating them. Um, But the Chargers, quite frankly, if they're able to win this game against the Bengals and then take care of business with the Giants, where they absolutely should beat the Giants. The Giants are a very bad football team. Everyone in the league knows that. If they're able to do that and then set themselves up to get a little momentum going up against the Chiefs, and if they're able to get that game, then they can really control their own destiny. But you have to be able to win these football games. This is where these games really start to matter. And it is nice that the Chargers are playing meaning, meaningful football going into December, but, I mean, that you still have to win to make sure that they're meaningful because, well, not really. I mean, if you lose, it could be that much more meaningful in the opposite yeah. direction. So. You, you got to take care of business against these teams. This Bengals team, man, I'm telling you, this is going to be really, really tough with Joe Burrow and Joe Mixon especially and his ability to run the football. He absolutely went crazy last weekend. So that scares you as a Charger fan. But, I mean, this is what it's going to take. You're going to have to go up against one of these style of teams in the playoffs, and you got to be ready for it. Well, and like we're going to talk about pretty much the whole show today, like the Chargers aren't a perfect team. They're not a team where you just feel like – they can go out and win, you know, against any team. It feels like more of a matchup-based team where there's going to be certain teams that they match up much better against, right? The Chargers somehow match up better against, like, the Bills than they do, you know, the Titans when they had Derrick Henry or, you know, the Ravens with their rushing attack, you know? So, like, that is going to matter towards the end of the season, and I just think that that's why these games are so important. And, like, you don't really need any other reason to get up for that game. I mean, Joe Burrow versus Justin Herbert, like, that's a matchup we missed out on last year in the Tyrod Taylor game. Should have like, got flexed, by the way. It should have got flexed, but I mean, the Chargers didn't really show that on Sunday. But I mean, I'm pretty stoked, David. I mean, obviously, Joe Burrow's had a better defense working with him, you know, but this game's going to be huge in so many ways. And like, I am excited that that's the game we get to preview this week because it should be a banger. Oh, dude, that's going to be so much fun. I mean, Joe Burrow, obviously, incredible quarterback. I think he's, you know, from that class, like, That dude's legit. He can really, really throw the football. He has some legitimate weapons on his side. And, you know, obviously, I think these two guys are going to be linked. I mean, I think they have kind of different characteristics. Uh, Obviously, very, very very talented. But, you know, they're different guys. Justin Herbert's not the flashy guy, although he has all the talent in the world and all the intelligence. And then Joe Burrow is kind of, you know, Joey Cool. He he really has that personality that you like. He's magnetic. I think they're both mag- magnetic, but just in different ways. What we do know is there should be a lot of offensive firepower in this game, and it's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, and I mean, just two guys that are always going to be linked to each other getting taken in the draft class. And it's not one of those things like the Chargers never really had a chance at Joe Burrow, yeah. so it's not like, oh, Chargers missed out or whatever. But, like, both have shown they can be really good, you know, at times, and both have struggled at times. The These early. are the top two guys from the class. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and even two is playing pretty well. So it's looking like a pretty good class as of right now still, even though a lot still has to be determined. But up next, I do want to talk about the biggest problems with the offense and defense. Because I think whether you're looking at play calling or just Justin Herbert, is Brandon Staley doing enough? Does he have enough to work with defensively? There are some definite things you can point at to why this charge offense has been so frustrating to watch and why the defense maybe hasn't lived up to the hype if they even have the, you know, the players to have deserved that hype to begin with. I think that all is kind of rolled into it. But we're going to get into the biggest problems the Chargers have had so far this season coming up after this. But first, I need to tell you guys about Beachbound because in life, we're all bound for different things. With Beachbound.com vacations, you could be bound for adventure, bound for passion. You could be bound for discovery or bound for togetherness. You could be bound for immersion, bound for rejuvenation, or you may 
be bound for encountering the unexpected. Personally, when I'm at a beach resort, I'm bound to end up poolside at a bar, maybe creating my own taco flight. As long as I've got a good view and a good drink in my hand, I'll be as happy as can be. And with beachbound.com, you can find the perfect beach vacation for you, no matter what you're looking for. What are you bound for? Visit beachbound.com today. All right, David. Well, this is a very all-encompassing segment, right? I mean, it would take five shows to talk about all the problems the Chargers have faced offensively and defensively. But we work in a show where we, you know, have three 10-minute segments that end up being, you know, 12, 15-minute segments at times. Often go a lot longer, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Brevity hasn't always been our strong suit. But offensively, I think, is where... You have the biggest frustration just because you know how many quality pieces you have. We'll talk about the defensive side, but like when you're talking about really good defensive players, right? Who are you talking about? Like Joey Bosa, obviously. Derwin James. Asante Samuel Jr. has played well. You know, it, it's hard. it gets harder, right, after the top two now, guys. I think Nas is turning into one of those guys. I mean, I thought he's really ratcheted up his game. Also, Kaiser White. Those yep. two dudes have really started entering that conversation with what they've put forth this year. Exactly. And I mean, there, it, it, but all I'm saying is like, there's you know, a few guys you feel really good about, and then it gets a lot Definitely. murkier. And like, there's other guys sure. who have played well, Linval Joseph too. I mean, but there's a lot more question marks with offense. You know, Justin Herbert's good. You know, Keenan Allen's good. You know, Austin Eckler's really good. You know, Corey Lindsley's good. And Rashawn Slater is really good, you know, and even the guys below really that good. are pretty good. You know, Mike Williams, pretty good. You know, some of the other guys, pretty good. Jared Cook's okay. Donald Parham is pretty good. Whatever. But that is definitely the side of the ball that has taken the most heat, you know. So when you're looking at, like, the biggest problems, I think there's some obvious ones to point out. But, like, what do you think has really been holding this offense back from, you know, looking like one of the better offenses in the league week in and week out? It's the deficiency on the right side of the line. I mean, I think that's the the biggest thing for me when I look at this offense. I see explosive weapons on the outside. I see a running back who is one of the better dual threat type of just weapons in the league with Austin Eckler. But I see teams continuously take advantage of the obvious weakness that the Chargers have thrown out there every single week on offense, and that's the right side of the line. The Chargers tried to address that when they signed Brian Bulaga to that three-year contract. Obviously, we have the benefit of of hindsight. That deal was terrible. Brian Bulaga had not been able to stay healthy. He's been a huge liability. And because of that contract, it kind of you know told Tom Telesco that it's okay that he didn't have to invest in that position because he thought he already had that solved. That has been continuously picked on throughout this season. Storm Norton's played admirably, but let's be real. Storm Norton is a backup. I mean, he's not a starting caliber right tackle in this league. So the Chargers have to address that position, whether it's in free agency or in the draft. They need to get younger. They need to get better. And they need to get more dependable. Yeah, and that's the thing about the Chargers offense is like, you have seen, you know, more inconsistency since the guys you thought you were going to have out there haven't been out there. Because even when Brian Bulaga went down, as bad as Storm Norton has been, you know, a handful of games especially where it's like, you know, eight, nine pressures allowed, sacks allowed, whatever. He still, you still had a lot on the rest of the line, you know, that made you feel better about it. You still had Ode Obushi for some of those mm-hmm. games, right? And he was a solid pickup when he was out there. Matt Filer, Corey Lindsley, and Rashawn Slater, you've always Huge. felt good about but yeah. there's no, you know, coincidence that the Chargers gave up 19 pressures on Sunday when they were down three of those guys, and I think it just puts such an important on the offensive line depth. And I do absolutely think that that's hurt this Chargers offense. But there is one guy in particular in Joe Lombardi that's been taking a lot of the heat, and there's certain frustrations I absolutely understand because I do think at certain points it does look like you know the Saints' offense when Drew Brees was the quarterback and a lot of pinpoint passes, and the Chargers have moved the ball, but. All little errors add up way more when you have to go 12 to 13 plays to finish a drive with a touchdown. I mean, it's just more plays yeah. to get a holding call, more plays to have an interception, blah, blah, blah. You're just doing it more methodically. And I think Joe Lombardi should take, you know, some responsibility for that. The Chargers have been 20th overall in explosive plays. I think one of the biggest things has been the running game, just not the consistent running game that you've wanted. Because when you look at it, 103 yards per game, not terrible, right? I think it's around 20th, 22nd in the NFL. But 
At the same time, if you take away, you know, Justin Herbert's 22 rushing yards per game was why he's averaged so far. Now you're sitting at about 80 rushing yards per game, which is a totally different story, right? It makes you one of the worst running teams in the league. And I posted about it on Twitter just how much has been put on Justin Herbert's plate, like 811 out of the 890 total yards of offense they've had over the last two games has come either with Justin Herbert's arm or Justin Herbert's legs. That's a lot for a second-year quarterback. And there's a lot of guys catching short passes and doing things with it. You know, Austin Eckler, Donald Parham, Keenan Allen has done a lot and gotten, you know, some yards after the catch when he's not trying to cut back, which doesn't work for him anymore. But that's just to say, like, there's a lot of things that have been working. Obviously, certain things have been holding them back. The drops have killed them. When you have a team like this that wants to connect on these drives and go so many plays, one drop can throw off an entire drive, and we've seen that, you know, so many times. One batted down pass can derail a drive, you know. These interceptions coming after penalties, coming after, you know, big plays that have been called back, that's been a huge issue too. I do think Joe Lombardi, David, does deserve some criticism, but when you look at the charge being, you know, third in DVOA offensively, I mean, they've been a very efficient offense, even if it hasn't felt like it lately. Eighth most total yards, you know, around the top 10 in total points scored, they can do better in that department. But I do think it is kind of a cop-out just to be like, it's Joe Lombardi when obviously you've seen the effects that the injured offensive line has brought and some of the other things that, you know, come from that is, you know, especially wanting deep plays down the field when you don't have maybe the protection that's going to hold up for it. Yeah. I mean, that's another thing that the chargers need to do is add some speed too. I mean, they have several yeah. possession guys on the team and their speed guy, Jalen Guyton has not gotten really any opportunities to stretch the field and you have to beg the question, why? Do they not trust him? I mean, they I mean, haven't he's done tried that it, at, but at he all. He doesn't have a single long catch this year. Not like that. Right. Like, it it ball. just hasn't It hasn't worked. So that they need to add that element to this offense for yeah. sure. It's something I feel like that is sorely missed. Obviously, a, a, another backup running back as well or just a solid RB2, the, that's a big problem as well. Austin Eckler is, is a great player, but he can't handle the entire load. And nobody has stepped up behind him whatsoever you haven't gotten any kind of production behind Austin Eckler at the running back position and they've cycled three or four guys out there to try to get some kind of spark and it just has not happened it's but, huge yeah yeah it's massive but the one thing I, I look at with Joe Lombardi that I do think kind of rings true is that if he doesn't start the games well and get into a really good o- offensive rhythm right away and have a really strong drive to start the game he has a hard time finding his rhythm as a play caller. And that's something yeah. he needs to work out. He needs to start making better adjustments when things aren't going well. When the game plan that you scripted out doesn't work, you need to scrap that thing and try to build something else and try to attack something else. Use your weapons in a different way. Yeah. And then we might see some kind of difference. But that I, I don't think all of the criticism for Joe Lombardi is warranted. I do think some of it is, and I do think, the part of it that I truly believe in is that starting offense. He really has to get off to a good start or his rhythm is just all out of whack. Yeah. And the adjustments haven't always been there. And I think the other thing too, is Justin Herbert has some culpability as well, but I do think, you know, the lack of overall speed and having that deep threat has absolutely hurt this team. And I don't necessarily think that Jalen Guyton is getting the respect of true deep threats, right. And doing what those guys do for an offense, as far as spacing and things like that. In the second running back, I mean, the tough thing is, is you have a seventh round pick in Justin Jackson. You have a fourth round pick in Josh Kelly and a sixth round pick in Larry Roundtree. You've tried to do things and you failed at finding that guy. The best guy you have on your team was undrafted. But we do have to look at the defensive side of things. But as far as Justin Herbert goes, I mean, I think it is just a learning process. I mean, he has struggled with some of the coverages. There have been times where guys aren't getting open and there's been times with offensive line not holding up has gotten to him and sped up his process and he has missed some open guys, right? In times they're trying to take deep shots where the offensive line isn't holding up, right? A lot of things, the fastballs, things he can work on as well. But this is just to say there's a lot of things that are holding the charge. But the offense kid's back. incredibly intelligent. And the more experience that he gets, the better it's going to be for him. Just imagine he's this good right now. With the more defenses he sees and the more offense he goes out there and executes, this kid is going to be incredible, and he already is. So just imagine that. Yeah, and, and it is. I mean, teams are doing certain things against him that have been working well, and there's been times where he's done well against those things, like the Eagles, right? But when teams are able to get pressure and drop so many guys back there in coverage, 
that's something he hasn't been good at. And you saw a lot of interceptable passes last week that I think were a direct result of that. And I think you have to, as an offensive coordinator, find ways to get around it, find ways to give him more comfortable throws. And he has to do better at deciphering what he's seeing out there post snap and, you know, realizing, Hey, just cause guys are near the line of scrimmage doesn't mean they're going to come means that, you know, there might be out of position to maybe exploit it, but he's done really good against the blitz at times when teams are able to get pressure without the blitz and just have a lot of guys out there and the chargers aren't really stretching the field really condenses what you can do offensively. And I think that's been part of the problem, but there's obviously some big problems in the Chargers defense too, because the Chargers brought in a defensive mastermind in Brandon Staley. And, you know, the defense hasn't done well. It doesn't, it hasn't looked like they're being coached by a defensive mastermind. So is that a Brandon Staley thing? Is this, you know, a Tom Telesco thing of just not bringing in enough talent on that side of the ball? I think those are both fair questions. I think it's two things that we're going to have to get into in the next segment because we went so long in the offense. So after this, we'll be getting into, you know, what's been wrong with the Chargers defense so far. And also, you know, kind of put the magnifying glass up to Tom Telesco and what he's done in the last couple of draft classes to help build a Super Bowl playoff contending roster. And I mean, we already talked about not having the depth on the offensive line. Well, there's some obvious lapses in roster depth on the defense that has really hurt the Chargers as well. And we'll get into that coming up right after this. But first, I have to tell you guys about the official betting sponsor of the Locked On Chargers podcast, and that's betonline.ag. BetOnline has you guys covered all seasons with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. As football season continues the march towards the playoffs, BetOnline remains your number one spot for all sports action this season. Head to the new updated West desktop or mobile website to sign up today, and you guys can receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit with the promo code LOCKEDON. That's promo code LOCKEDON, all caps, one word to receive that bonus because sports betting is great. I mean, it makes all sports more interesting. It makes things, even when you don't have a lot of good sports to watch, right? You'll want to watch it if you have something riding on it. And the best thing is to have house money on it. And BetOnline is going to help you guys out there, give you some money to play with so you guys can bet a little and win a lot with BetOnline. And from football, basketball, NHL, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers they have available for the 2021 season. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, David, let's turn things over to the defensive side of things here because the Chargers defense hasn't been good. I mean, that's they've had their moments, right? And there's some certain, certain things that I think they've been missing. Injuries have played a factor as well. I mean, you've had injuries to Asante Samuel Jr., who's much needed right now. Michael Davis has been out. Justin Jones has been out. Chris Harris Jr. got his season off to a rocky start dealing with a lot of injuries. A lot to go around in defensive line depth as well. I mean, Limbaugh Joseph having to miss the last two games has been really tough too. But when you're looking, where would you start for the defensive problems that you've seen so far? Is it brain Staley? Is it something else where it kind of, how are you looking at it? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not going to blame Brandon Staley. I, I think, uh, you know, Brandon Staley has done the best that he could with the personnel that he is, was given for this first year as the head coach and the defensive coordinator and play caller for the defense for the chargers. I, I can't put, all of that on Brandon. Brandon hasn't had enough time in his role to be able to work through getting the type of guys and the type of players that he needs to orchestrate this defense the way he really wants to. And I think one of the big issues is on the defensive line. I think we've talked about it at nauseum. There just is no guy in the middle of that defensive line that you feel like, you know, snap in and snap out can really you know, bust through a double team that, that can dominate against the run that, that can really take over a game. You know, there's a couple of guys that can do that in spurts, but there's nobody that really showcases that type of dominance, you know, that you really need in in the interior. And the chargers have really sorely missed that throughout, you know, Tom Telesco's tenure. He has done a great job of adding to his assets on the outsides and really neglected the interior of his team on the offensive line and the defensive line. They've tried, they've thrown a lot of darts at the dartboard on the defensive line, but nobody has really stood out. Yeah, I mean, I think if there's one thing you would look at Staley and maybe, you know, put some blame towards him, it would just be like, you know, Jerry Tillery coming back and getting 80% of the snaps on the defensive line when you saw really positive plays from young guys like Braden Fajoko and Joe Gaziano and Forrest Merrill the game before against the Steelers, who admittedly didn't have as good of a rushing attack as the Broncos right. did. So it's not really comparing apples to apples. But at least you saw the fight. You saw some guys making plays. And I just think that 
you've seen him take Kenneth Murray off the field, right, in favor of Drew Tranquil, even if that might have taken just, you know, Kenneth Murray's injury to kind of get that started. He's at least been willing to take that guy if he thinks there's a better option. Like, I think especially on running downs, there are clear better options than Jerry Tillery, and I don't know if he's making the difference in the pass rush game to, you know, offset the flaws that he has in his game at this point. And, you know, he's a first-round pick, and he's going to get a lot of criticism. And a lot of it is deserved, but it is not something that you're like, okay, well, Brandon Staley's not making it work with a super talented group of guys there. And that's something that Tom Telesco has failed to address because you say, you know, a lot of darts at the dartboard. I mean, a lot of it is, you know, Cortez Broughton in the seventh round, you know, Justin yeah. Jones in the third round, bringing in Brandon Meebane. I didn't and, say they know, got the close to the dart. bullseye. I just said he threw a no. lot of darts at the dartboard. <laughs> hey, but I mean, maybe not even enough though, right? Maybe you haven't invested right. enough. Maybe you haven't, you know, gone out and signed younger guys that might cost a little bit more. That's all fair, I think, to wonder. But I think with the Chargers defense this year, I mean, the red zone defense hasn't been good, allowing 65.1% of, you know, other teams to score touchdowns once they get into the red zone. It's up over 70 over the last three, you know, three games or so. Third down defense. That's been the real critical thing. Really bad, yeah. Yeah, and like a lot of it, you know, has to do with the run defense, which has also been another big problem as well. A lot of manageable third downs. But 31st in the NFL, allowing 48.91% conversion rate on third down. A league high 52.5 over the last three games. And 72% against the Broncos. Yeah, so against the Broncos. Jeez. <laughs> you can't. You, it's so hard to win defensively when you can't get off the field. And the Chargers And going into that game, the Broncos were converting at 34%. Like, yeah. that's that's what makes it even worse is you had one of the worst teams in the league converting third downs and the chargers basically let them convert almost all of them. It was yeah. a really bad eight out of 11. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than that. And like the really concerning part of the last couple of games is like, you're getting them into third and longs too, right? Yeah. And you're still not able to get off the field. The Pittsburgh picked up some of those, the Vikings picked up some long third downs with Kirk cousins, you know? And another thing is just, you're not, you know, before that you weren't getting enough pressure. And I think that's another roster thing where it's like, do you really have the supporting cast around Joey Bosa still? I mean, you don't have Melvin Ingram anymore. That was a decision Tom Tulasco made to let him go. Tried to replace it with the Chen and Wosu, who, you know, we wanted to get a bigger role, but we wanted to see what he's had. He's been super inconsistent. Kyler Fackrell hasn't been the answer. Chris Rump is obviously a fourth round pick from this year. Too soon to tell, but there's not enough help for Joey. And we've seen him getting double, triple teamed way too many times and like there's not the help on the interior either because Linval Joseph is not a pass rush specialist Jerry Tillery is needed there in pass rush right but you have to get more obvious situations where you can put him in there and it's not just something that's just going to totally hinder your defense because they're going to run the ball right at him so I do think there are some better calls that can be made for Brand Staley on third down but like I've said many times it's like you see the guys there like you can tell what they're going for there and I just think as much as I want to jump on, you know, Brand Staley and like Ronaldo Hill doesn't call plays, so like he's not taking any flack. And you know, the secondary coach Derek Ansley isn't taking a lot of slack for some guys not playing as well. But how much talent did the Chargers have there going in, at least at cornerback and defensive back? Like I think you're happy with what you've gotten out of the safeties. Alohi Gilman, a sixth round pick, obviously is kind of whatever at this point. You're not expecting much out of a sixth round pick, but you knew going into it how much you were gonna to have to rely on a guy like Asante Samuel Jr. As a rookie, like, and that's I love a problem. Him. Yeah, you shouldn't have to rely on him as much as he did. And this is where I'll credit Tom Telesco. Like, the free agent additions this season, you can see what they were going for, and a lot of it's worked out. Corey Lindsley, great oh, signing. Yeah. Matt Filer, great signing. Odea Bushi, bargain contract. Christian Covington, whatever. You didn't do enough. You know, you tried to put a band aid on, you know, something, have yeah. a take a leg on an amputated leg there. Right, but it, it, it that's not necessarily going to do it, you know. So like, I'm not going to bash that signing. This is the tough part. We know Brandon Staley's had some really good players fault him in the draft, and he's done a good job of waiting and getting those players, and you know, not mortgaging the future to move up for them. Yeah. But are you getting production out of the rest? I mean, this year, you know, Rashawn Slater, Sante Samuel Jr., good. We we feel really good Definitely. about that. Home Josh runs. Palmer, I'd still give it the thumbs up at this point. I still can nice see double. It. I can see it. Trey McKitty, Chris Rump, Brendan Hymas, Nick Neiman, Larry Roundtree, Mark Webb Jr. Haven't seen him, you know, and, and this is very little production from many of those guys. Yeah, they all made the team and they haven't had significant impacts on the team so far this year. And you also, let's not forget, decided, you know, you let go of Hunter Henry, who's had a really good season in New England. You let go of Melvin Ingram, your pass rush hasn't been good. 
you let go Casey Hayward and that money was never going to make sense. And he, you know, I thought it was the right move at the time as well because he looked like your special time. teams unit it was absolutely terrible last year. It's terrible right. again this year. You've right. had two playoff appearances in the nine years that you've been the general manager of the Chargers. This offseason, I think if the Chargers still have Tom Telesco as the general manager, like this is it. This is the absolute last opportunity for Tom because he's going to have carte blanche both in yeah. draft picks and in in payroll. He's going to have so much cap space. He's going to have more money than he has ever had before in his current position. If he doesn't get it right this time, then you have to let him go. You well, absolutely think, yeah. have to let him go. I think the startling thing is just like how many guys are like either unusable or not even on the team anymore from the yeah. last few drafts. You know, like obviously this year all the guys are there, but like KJ Hill – you know, not on the team anymore. Gone. Joe Reed, practice squad guy now. Alohi Gilman, six round pick, right? That's fine. You know, Josh Kelly, is anyone feeling really good about that at this point? No, even though he had no. a nice catch in the last game, right? The other two picks, Herbert and Murray. Herbert, obviously, home run pick. Kenneth Murray trading, you know, your third round pick to move up from the second back into the first. This doesn't look like a roster that was fixed, you know. It looks like you could probably have used a second and a third round pick there, right? That's obviously looking bad at this point. It's still early in his career, but doesn't look great. More of my, you know, focus on KJ Hill, Lowen Gilman, Joe Reed, Josh Kelly. There's not a lot of impact there in those guys right now. The free agent class, Brian Bulanga, Chris Harris Jr., bust obviously at this point through what we've seen so far. Limbaugh Joseph, great signing. Nick Vigil, solid signing, right? But you also, you know, not a lot of that's helping you this season besides Limbaugh Joseph, no. really. 2019 right. draft. Jerry Tillery, eh, Nazir Adderley, happy with that. You know, I'm, I I think if you second round pick, he's solid and he at least looks like he's getting better. I'm happy with that pick. Trey Pipkins speaks for itself. Easton Living. Stick, Emeka Boy, Cortez Broughton, guys that are either not making an impact at all combined with Trey Pipkins, right, or they're not on the team. Or anymore. holding a clipboard. Yeah. So out of that draft, you have Nazir Adderley, Andrew Tranquil, who – Still aren't Pro Bowl players, right? That's not like they're world beaters, but you feel okay about those. Very good players, though. Yeah, very good players. Yeah, and it's just, that's not enough impact out of three draft classes. What did we name? Four guys out of the three draft classes that we feel good about? I'd say. And more like three and a half. (laughs) How many do you feel great about in the last three years? Justin Herbert, Rashawn Slater, Asante Samuel Jr. Definitely. Three guys in three drafts, right? And then like, you just have to be getting something out of those other guys. They have to come along to go in for a Matt Filer the if depth, Brendan Heim is. The depth picks yeah. have been the big problem, and they just absolutely crystal clear Achilles heel yeah. for Tom Telesco. And like like I said, like I like the just you know, I like the guys he brought in this year, especially the offensive line. This is the most concerted effort. The problem is is you had a festering wound that lingered for too long where it got to the point where it couldn't be fixed in one offseason because it was so poor. You couldn't keep guys from your earlier draft classes like a Forest Lamp, like a Dan Feeney, like a Sam Tebby, because the guys didn't work out. You haven't been able to draft good offensive linemen outside of Rashawn Slater. One in nine years for Tom Telesco. That's not a great ratio. And it took you nine years to do it. On the defensive interior, who's the guy he's drafted that's made a significant impact? Like Justin Jones, I think, is fine, you know, but that's one guy in how many years? Like Jerry Tillery is has clear, obvious deficiencies, you know? So I think Tom Tulesco does have a lot of blame. This is not, uh, this is, Brayden Seeley has overachieved with this roster so far, yeah. in my opinion. I think that it, he deserves time, you know, and I think I, I can see what he's going for defensively, and I do think, obviously, he's a smart enough guy to figure it out, but the Chargers have to be better in those areas. Third down, red zone. That's where you win and lose games in this league, especially with close games. And the Chargers haven't been able to force enough field goals, haven't been able to get off the field on those third downs. And part of that's because you don't have a good, you know, opposite pass rusher to Joey Bosa that's consistent. You don't have interior pass rushers that are consistent. You don't have coverage guys on the outside that can hold up when those pass rushers aren't getting home. These are all, you know, clear deficiencies. And Tom Tulesco, even though I like what he's done and there's still, you know, the, it, we're still yet to grade all of the draft picks from this year and stuff. Like it just hasn't been enough. And like at, th- at this point you weren't able to do enough, even in a strong off season with a first good couple of draft picks to fix all the bad that you already, you know, had kind of put into place. So just the fundamentals of football were neglected for too long, protecting yeah. the passer, 
getting after the passer, stopping the run, and running the football. The very, very few core principles yeah. were neglected for so long, and now they were finally – you started to address them. You started to really strengthen them and get better. But it might be for Tom Telesco too little, too late. Yeah, no, I mean, it might be. And we'll see, you know, kind of how they feel about that. But I do think there's an argument, you know, for Joe Lombardi, for Brandon Staley. is like, I don't have the horses to put up consistently good performances on either side of the ball. I don't have the offensive line depth to do the things we want to do with this offense. I don't have the guys defensively to do what we want to do outside of, you know, a few handful of good players. There's just not enough. And the guys that aren't playing well are getting targeted. And that's a big problem. But I think those are the key issues on both sides. And I do think it's very more than fair. I wrote a four part article of like 8,000 words on what I thought about Tom Telesco's draft classes. Not a lot of impact players besides the ones that stand out to you. Obviously you add that together with letting guys like an Adrian Phillips go, letting a Hunter Henry go, letting guys that could help the team go in free agency. Cause you don't want to spend some money on it. Even though when some of those guys were absolutely worth bringing back, this is what you get. You know, you get a team that if the depth starts fading a little bit, you don't have the guys to step in and fill in for it. And there's obviously Man, some imagine the secondary just with Adrian Phillips alone. I mean, uh, he would help a ton. Sick. Yeah, he would help a ton. And they didn't have a clear air to the throne, you know, enough behind Casey Hayward and Chris Harris Jr. When that was the plan, didn't do enough to be ready for when those guys were over the hill. Right. Just a lack of preparation. Didn't know what you were going to do after Brandon Meebane. You tried to solve it with Limbaugh Joseph. It just hasn't it hasn't worked out. And those places, those main fundamentals just have not been nearly good enough for the Chargers. And it can get better. And we'll see, you know, I, I, this season's not over. And we talked about that at the beginning of the show. This team can still do things, but they are going to have to get great play, you know, from Justin Herbert. They are going to have to get some guys stepping up and, you know, exceeding expectations defensively for that unit to turn things around and need Herculean efforts from guys like Derwin James and Joey Bosa, because that's just what, what it's going to take with the current personnel. But that is going to wrap things up for today's show. I mean, a lot to vent about with the Chargers and a lot of problems that you can clearly see need to get addressed. And they, you know, have a chance to do that. Like no team is perfect roster wise. You can still win with the guys that you have right now, but I understand the argument to say that maybe the coordinators and the head coach don't have enough to work with on each side of the ball, but we do have more to get into tomorrow. If you guys join back with us, Maybe do some voicemail venting. I know we have a couple already. We haven't done some voicemails in a while. We have a crossover Thursday coming up this week with the Locked On Bengals podcast. That's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that. A lot of storylines there for sure. And make sure you guys don't miss it by subscribing to our new Locked On Chargers YouTube channel. If you're watching it right now, you can go to the bottom of the page and click that. And following us wherever you get your podcast from, whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the new you know Odyssey app, tune in, or wherever you get your podcast from. And make sure to rate and review if you can there as well. But you can follow us on social media on Twitter at Lockdown LAC for the show. And for me on Twitter at Dan Talk Sports and David Drogmeyer on Twitter at Drotalk SD. We also have an at Lockdown Chargers Instagram page and a Lockdown Chargers Facebook page. We post the show to all of those places every day. So thank you guys for coming in and hanging out with us today. Excited to get into some voicemails potentially tomorrow and keep looking at how the Chargers can turn this season around and keep things going to make a playoff push. But until then, take it easy and go Bolts.